So, boy, it is nice seeing everybody here this morning. And uh, I'm excited about what God is doing in our world. I am really excited about it. These are the days of Christ's return. I have a feeling we are going to get to witness that. In the meantime, our world is going to look a little tumultuous, isn't it? Guess what? We've seen the tip of the iceberg. So just brace yourself a little bit, but guess what? God is in control. He's the one in control of it all, and we can trust him that he is our shelter in the midst of the storm. <clears throat> As I shared with some of you who were here after we taped our last service uh, about that three-part series on Christ's return, um, Christ's words were, get on the bandwagon with me, get my message out, and you have absolutely nothing to fear in this world. So that's our mission in, the, in this world, isn't it, as a church? Get his message out. If we're doing that, he's going to make provision for us to get his, word, his message out. And so we just got to keep focused on that. And you know, <clears throat> talking about anxiety and worry, as I was preparing this message, I came across this saying. Worry is like sitting in a rocking chair. It will give you something to do, but it won't get you anywhere. In fact, it'll get you a lot to do, won't it, sometimes, but get you nowhere. And honestly, worry and anxiety have hounded the human race since the beginning of time. And modern man, with all of our innovations, has not found the cure for this plague. It's still with us, isn't it? So what is our answer? How do we deal with it? How do we deal with the worry and the anxiety that can so easily set in on us? <clears throat> well, let me just throw this out to start us off this morning. Imagine with me a ferocious ocean storm beating against a rocky shore. Feel like our world sometimes? The lightning flashes, the thunder roars, the waves lash the rocks. Okay? But then, imagine that you see a crevice in the rocky cliff far above the ocean surge. And inside that crevice is a little tiny bird its head serenely tucked under its wing, fast asleep. How can it be asleep? It knows the rock will protect it from the storm that's raging outside, and so it sleeps in peace. And along this line, didn't God promise Moses, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand. And guess what? That's God's promise to us as well. See, Christ is our rock. He is a firm foundation on which we can build our lives and the storms of this world. Did he not say that? Those who base our, we base our lives on his teachings, what will we be like? A house built upon the rock. And though the storms of life rage against that house, it will not fall. Because its anchor, its foundation is sure. And see, the storms of this world will rage. But guess what, friends? Our hearts can be at rest because we can know that we are secure in his hands forever. And so to really dig into this concept, will you turn with me to John chapter 14? I want us to look at verses 27 through 31 this morning as our text. And you know, throughout Scripture, God tells us his people not to worry. You know, honestly, has worry ever worked anything out? No, it, it hasn't. Nothing has ever come to be or not to be because we've worried. And, and let's just picture this for a moment, okay? Let's go back to that picture of the rocking chair. Imagine that you're sitting in that rocking chair of worry and you're working at rocking that chair, okay? You're worrying as much as you can. Anybody ever been there, done that? Okay, I know I have. And the more you, more you worry, the harder you rock. And, and to get more done, you double down on the intensity of your worry work. Some of us are familiar with this, right? Thinking more will be accomplished because of our efforts. It's just so hard to let go of it, isn't it? But does anything really get accomplished? Does anything change because of all our efforts at worrying? No, not at all. Well, except I take that back. Except for one thing, okay? One thing does change. The only thing that changes because of our worry is what? 
our energy level. We exhaust ourselves, don't we? That's the only thing that changes. We simply wear ourselves out. But instead, friends, see, instead, God wants to give us rest. He wants us to find peace and rest for our souls. He wants to guard our hearts and our minds with his peace so that we can rest and we can find strength in him for the days ahead. See, his peace guards our hearts and minds, and his joy then that we can know in the midst of that becomes our strength. And so we can rest when we know that God is at work in our world. And so with that in mind, here's our text. And this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, which then translates to us. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And then he says some very important words, very key for what's coming up. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you really loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. So guess where we're at and what's about to happen, okay? I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. Does it feel like the prince of this world is coming into our world with ferocity nowadays? Yeah, feels like the spirit of lawlessness is being unleashed on our culture. Guess who has already faced him and overcome him? Think about this. this I, will speak with you not, I, will, I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me, but the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded. Come now, let us leave. I love those last words, and you're going to see why in just a moment, why I love those last five words. Come now. Let us leave. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word and the hope that we find in your word that it is a sure anchor for our souls. It is a foundation on which we can build our lives, our families, our culture, and you will not fail us. And so, God, I ask that you would speak into each of our lives this morning. Open our eyes, our hearts to the truth, to understand the concepts from your word and how we can put them into practice in our lives so that in this day that we live in, we can find peace for our souls that is a sure anchor and we can find strength in you. God, not just to hunker down and be safe, but, Father, we can move forward. We can advance your kingdom in the face of all the darkness that our culture is facing. To that, so that in this day we live in, we can still reach lost people whom you care about so much. And Father, I just ask for fresh anointing upon our time this morning. And I ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, our scripture text for today takes place rather obviously, as I have already been mentioning, during the Last Supper. Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room enjoying his final Passover celebration with them before his appointment with the cross. And I want to use those words specifically, his intended, destined appointment with the cross, because that's the reason he came into this world, is it not? Okay? And as you'll see today, Jesus then is inviting his disciples into the ensuing drama. He's inviting them to participate with him in what's coming, just as Christ invites us to participate with him in what he is doing in our world today. And he's preparing his disciples for the coming events so that they are going to be ready for what all unfolds. They're not going to be caught unprepared. Just as he prepares us for what lies ahead. He does not want us to be unaware or unprepared, okay? And he wants us to know his peace in the midst of us, in the midst of all that goes on. But here's the catch. It's up to us to respond properly. It's up to us to respond properly. We have to make a choice. So lying behind everything that I'm going to say today is this concept. We must prepare ourselves so that we can rest in his peace. We need to prepare our hearts. In fact, if you catch nothing else from this message this morning, please catch this. God wants us to be prepared. He wants to help us prepare for the days ahead so that we can rest and respond then in his peace and his strength. 
okay? But it's a choice that we have to make. And I hope after today, you're not only able, you're ooh, excited to make that choice. Yes. Yeah. My God has won this battle, and I get to be part of it, okay? But our preparation all starts with this. It's what Jesus offers us. Jesus offers us his peace. He offers it to us. Verse 27 of our text, he says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Okay? So what is this peace that Jesus offers? What does it look like? Well, first of all, to start with, as he says, it's not the peace that this world offers. And what is that like? Well, it's just the opposite. See, the peace this world provides usually comes because of two things. Either because of our own ignorance of coming danger, or it comes in the form of our human efforts, human whatever, solutions. And do either of them last? No, then ne neither one lasts. We stay ignorant of coming danger by trying to escape our reality, whether that's through substances we ingest in order to forget our reality, or here's another one that maybe more of us in this room might be into, through our forms of work or entertainment, right, that are designed to busy us and distract us from our reality. Anyone recognize this one? Okay? And if that doesn't work, then we resort to our own efforts and all the ways we try to create security for ourselves or resolutions to our conflicts or a lasting legacy that I will leave something here of importance. And these efforts aren't carried out only on a personal level, are they? The governments of our world work hard at this too. People the world over hope that we will all be able to work our way towards peace and that we will arrive there someday if everyone can just learn how to cooperate, right? If we can just all learn how to get along. But of course, is that going to happen among sinful, broken people? We know the answer to that one, don't we? And these are all worldly forms of peace that are all empty. Why? Because they don't last. They're only good for as long as the distraction lasts, as long as that bottle in our hand lasts, or as long as the work day lasts, or the video game lasts, or the hike lasts, or whatever it is else that we distract ourselves with, or for as long as sinful humans can cooperate, which we've already said isn't very long ever, is it? Or as long as the economy, or whatever other form of security we've built holds up. When these things end, so does our worldly sense of peace. We've built our peace on temporary, transitory things that do not last. And when they crumble, our peace crumbles with them. <clears throat> Christ's peace is not like that. Okay? His peace is different. And it's the very same peace that he had and he demonstrated in his life here on this planet. Think about that. His peace did not flee conflict. It didn't flee pain. It didn't flee death. In fact, it did not flee the cross. Christ's peace did not flee the cross. It sustained him through that, okay? In fact, the more the intense, the difficulty, the more apparent Jesus' peace became because his peace never faltered. And where did his peace come from? Pure and simple, Christ's peace came from the close connection he fostered, he built, he pursued with the Heavenly Father, okay? Who is the only unchanging one. Jesus knew exactly who to go to. See, Jesus knew the Father firsthand. He had a little leg up on us, didn't he? But at the same time, he knew this in his human form. He knew the Father's power and his authority. He knew the Father's plan and his faithfulness to work all things out for good because he had spent time with the Father. And I'm not talking about his pre-incarnate state. I'm talking about his time here on earth, right? He spent, how many times does scripture say he pulled away to pray? 
He called his disciples to pull away with him to rest and to seek the Father. Before choosing the 12 disciples, he spent all night in prayer. When's the last time we did that, right? Before going into ministry, he spent 40 days praying and fasting. Okay, he sought the Father. So he was able to rest in the Father's goodness. And this is the same peace he offers us if we are willing to pursue that same relationship. He offers it to us, but we have to accept it by doing something, okay? We have to consciously choose to step out of our worry, our patterns for worry, choose to come into his presence, and then choose to give to him, humbly give to him whatever it is that's troubling us. See, this is a blow to our pride, isn't it? We cannot do this on our own. Where, where does worry typically come from? I can do this on my own. Oh, no, I can't do this on my own anymore, but I've got to get it done on my own. We humble ourselves and come to God and say, God, this is above my head. I can't take care of this. Father, I need your help. Okay? We surrender it to him. See, and then it's his presence. It's his reassuring presence in our lives that gives us peace. So if we want true peace, it's only found in the close connection we pursue with our heavenly Father so that he can remind us daily that he is in control, that he is completely faithful no matter what we face in life, and that we can trust him. And friends, we need to experience that every single day, don't we? We need to pray until we experience breakthrough. We touch God, okay? And we can know that, secondly, Jesus fought for our peace. He fought for this. And this is brought out in verses 28 through 31 where Jesus tells his disciples, you heard me say, I am going away, I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me. But the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. See, Jesus was getting ready to depart and do some battling with the enemy, wasn't he? And when he was finished with that, he was going to present himself to the Father in heaven, then he would return. And I don't know the chronological order of all this. I'm just telling you what Jesus said he was going to do, okay? And he told his disciples this ahead of time in order to prepare them. He did not want them to be caught unaware and unprepared. So that then when it all unfolded, just as he said it would, what would happen? Their confidence, their faith in him would only increase. They could trust absolutely everything he says. This is why God gives us his prophecies in his word, right? They're not a, a map to tell us, okay, this minute this is going to happen. Now this hour this is going to happen. And it's going to happen exactly like this. Otherwise, we wouldn't have to trust him in anything, right? But he gives us just enough to, know to, enough to know that he's in control. He knows what the future holds. And he knows how it's going to work out. So he tells us ahead of time, here's what's coming. Prepare yourselves so that we can trust him. We can trust him completely. He is in control of our world. Okay? In the meantime, though, he knew the disciples' faith was going to be shaken. He knew that they were comfortable and at peace as long as they had his physical presence with them, right? And everything was going along smoothly for them. As long as he was feeding the 5,000 with the miraculous distribution of the fish and loaves. As long as he is healing the blind and raising the dead. This is awesome, isn't it? And they were at peace. But he also knew from previous experiences with them, say like the time they were out in the boat and he was asleep, right? Or the time they were out on the boat without his physical presence. What? Remove his physical presence from them and what would they do? What would we do? Yeah, they panic. They would freak out. Jesus! Don't you care about us? Hear those words. They were freaking out. They're panicking. Okay? So he was trying to prepare them for this temporary departure. And what was the reason for his departure? Why did Jesus have to go away? Well, the price for our redemption had to be paid. It was time. The time in God's calendar had come. Someone who had lived a sinless life 
had to die in our place, and the only person who could accomplish that was Jesus. But then, because he did not deserve the punishment of death, guess what? Death would have no hold on him or no, no claim against him, as verse 30 of our text states. This sinless one then could turn the tables on our enemy, which is exactly what Jesus did, isn't it? And you know what? Can I just be really honest with you? <clears throat> I don't truly feel this way, but sometimes I do. Sometimes I almost feel sorry for Satan, for what a blundering, idiotic fool he is. I really do. What a moron. And I, I don't say that lightly, because, I mean, he is a sp powerful spiritual enemy of ours. No way I'm going to come against him in my authority. No way. But he's also spiritually an idiot. I mean, it's almost as if Jesus was laying a trap for Satan, okay? Because what did Satan want to do? He hated Jesus. He just wanted to get rid of him. And he hates us because we're God's special creation. He wants to get rid of us. He wants to keep us in bondage. He wanted to destroy any hope that we might have. So he wanted to destroy Jesus, okay? And Satan, being the arrogant, boastful deceiver that he is, he actually thought he could succeed. And so here was Jesus, appearing all helpless and completely isolated, right? With no one around to help him. Satan knew he was going to be able to attack the disciples and get them to flee. Jesus had not called any angels in, legions of angels, to come to his side. So here Jesus was, the perfect target, and he was at his most vulnerable, or so it appeared, and Satan fell for it. But Jesus, knowing that his death would satisfy the Father's requirements for our forgiveness, I mean, he knew in this moment of his greatest trial, the moment when things seemed darkest, he knew he was going to be setting us free. He was redeeming his treasured possession. And knowing the authority that he walked in as the Son of God and the creator of this world, he stepped into this role on our behalf as the helpless, spotless Lamb of God. And friends, can I tell you, he absolutely blindsided the idiotic enemy that we have. <laughs> he came out of the blue with a left hook that crushed the enemy. This spotless and helpless lamb of God, friends, he turned out to be the raging lion of heaven. And he ate Satan's lunch. Let me tell you. And he satisfied the penalty handed down to us because of our sins. So he was able then to set us as captives free from the enemy's kingdom. We're no longer held under the enemy's thumb. Then he took back all authority in heaven and on earth, which the enemy, by the way, had stolen. Jesus simply took it back, and he defeated hell, death, and the grave, and all with one fell swoop. Jesus set the trap, Satan took the bait, and Jesus crushed the enemy's head, friends. Yeah. Jesus obliterated his plans. In fact, can I tell you this? He actually used the enemy's own plans, the enemy's own deceitful character against him. And he won such an incredible victory. Amen? Amen? So now we can have real peace in Jesus, knowing that he has already defeated the enemy for us. He has defeated our enemy. And he has overcome this world. And he did it single-handedly. And guess what he has in reserve? He hasn't even called out all the forces of heaven. Okay? Okay? Wait until that happens. I can't wait to see that day. I mean, you want to talk about an epic battle for the ages, and we get to be part of it. I mean, when he calls out the legions of angels and us as believers, and it's one anyway. It was just Jesus all on his own. He overcame all of hell. See, friends, there is no one greater than Jesus. No one in this world who has greater authority. No one who can defeat his plans. And friends, that can give us peace because we can know then that his plans for us and our world are the ones that will succeed. And his plans are good. Everything the enemy throws out there is nothing but bluster and lies. And he's already been defeated and he knows it. So he tries to trick us with fear with doubt, with worry. When Jesus has overcome him, he says, my people, I will, 
I will protect. You can build your house upon my teachings, and it's going to be a firm foundation. And there is no storm in this world that will take you. But guess what? We have to choose his peace. Jesus has made this available to us, but we have to act on it properly. And this is why... My final point this morning, Jesus invites us into his peace. He invites us to come in close and participate with him. Okay? And this is brought out in the last part of verse 31 when he says to his disciples, come now, let us leave. And I hope I'm not stretching this too much. You guys can tell me later if I am. I love this part. Because on the surface, it might seem like Jesus was simply telling his disciples that it was time to leave the upper room and their Passover celebration and go somewhere else for the night. Can I tell you, that's not all that Jesus is saying here. There's a whole lot more. There's so much more. The way he says this and the words he uses in the original language he spoke this in actually includes somewhat of this idea. He's saying... Come with me, my friends. Let us be going together to my destination with that hill called Calvary. I want you to be there with me in my greatest battle with death so that you will be able to witness my ultimate triumph over the enemy. That's what Jesus is saying. Come now, let us be going. He's inviting his disciples to come with him, to enter into this journey with him. And this is his will for them. It's not just an opinion he holds. It's not some wishful thinking. This is Christ's desire and his intentions for them. He wants them to be there with them so that they can watch the whole entire battle as it unfolds. And then when it's finished, when he has finally conquered hell, death, and the grave, they will be there and they will get to see him rise in victory. He wants them to be his witnesses as his disciples and his closest friends who have been there and walked with him through these three years in his moment of greatest victory. He wants them there with him. So then Gethsemane and the time of prayer in the garden was not just a little sideshow. <clears throat> and it was not just meant to fill time until Christ's arrest. Neither was it meant only for Jesus. It was meant for the disciples too in order to prepare them so that they would be ready. Friends, their faith would be ready to stand. They would be ready to see the battle for what it was and then respond with eyes of faith and not fear and be able to see the entire battle through. Now, of course, we know that the disciples did not respond in faith, did they? <clears throat> they didn't see the battle for it was. And why? Because they couldn't stay awake long enough in the garden to pray. Could they? They were weary. So they had no clue what was coming on them and on Jesus. And it was because they were lukewarm and lackadaisical in their prayer time. So then when the enemy came in and attacked, when he reared up and he roared with his fangs, right? What did it look like to the disciples? From viewing from their own human perspective, they fled in fear. And thus they declined Christ's invitation to watch the battle play out. They missed out on the greatest event in all of human history simply because they were viewing the situation from their own worldly and human perspectives and their own preconceived ideas and desires of how things should look instead of heavens. So when the battle finally presented itself, they were caught completely unprepared. They had not prepared properly for the battle. They had not spent time in the Father's reassuring presence. But Christ had invited them into it to come alongside of him and watch it unfold. But they, but they had to prepare so that they could see with eyes of faith. And from that perspective then, rest in Christ's peace, knowing they would be secure in him. Now, I will say this. They lacked one very important advantage that you and I have today as believers. And who is that? Yeah, they did not have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in their lives to empower them, did they? To help them see with eyes of faith. But guess what? 
after the day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, these disciples never made this mistake ever again. Instead, they went on to turn the entire Roman world upside down. They became like their Savior and King. They became roaring lions for the kingdom of God, didn't they? And guess what else? Jesus Christ has called believers in every generation to step up to the battle and see it for what it is. This is not a war against other human beings, against flesh and blood. It gets played out in our human realm, but it's so much more. This is a war against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And Christ invites us today to see the battle for what it really is, to be battling for a lost world who still needs Jesus. Amen? to be battling for justice, for law and order, but to begin our battle and completely bathe our battle in prayer and in the power of the Holy Spirit, who is the only one who can change the human heart. And friends, can I tell you, therein lies the problem. That's where the issue lies in our broken and sinful world. It is the broken human heart, and it's always been. And in the midst of this battle, though, as we battle for the lost of our world who still need Jesus, that's why we're still here, obviously. God still has souls he wants to bring into his kingdom. So he needs some soldiers to step to the battle, say, we're not done here yet, okay? There's still battle to be waged, not just for our nation. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about for the souls of lost people, okay, for the kingdom of God. In the midst of this battle, he wants us to know, guess what? His peace, that he is the one who is in control. He is the one calling the shots, okay? He fought for that peace. He invites us into it, even in the middle of the storm. So even as the battle rages, we can know that he is our cleft in the rock who can protect us from the, all the storms that this world throws at us and all the evil that wicked people have planned because, friends, our God is greater I mean, he took the enemy's plans the first time around. Turned them around, didn't he? Blindsided the enemy. Can't wait to see how he does it this time. Because you know he's going to do it. He's going to do it, okay? There is no one in all the world, both heaven above and earth below, who has greater authority than our Jesus. So as we close, and I invite our worship team back just to wrap up our time with this song, Oh, the Blood. I think it says it so well. Jesus laid his life down in what looked like worldly defeat, only to rise from the grave three days later in absolute victory. Friends, what has you troubled today? What are you fretting about and wrestling with in your heart? Guess what? Jesus wants to set you free. He wants to come alongside of you help you win that battle and know what true peace is all about in him. He does not want you to wear yourself out worrying about things that might never come to be. I heard another saying in one time, worry is interest we pay forward on a debt that may never materialize. You're paying on a debt that may never come to pass, okay? He wants you to get out of that rocking chair, though. But it starts by humbly coming into his presence, admitting your need for his help, and then choosing to see the battle as God would want you to see it. Friends, can I tell you, seeking his presence until you experience breakthrough, getting a fresh word or fresh insight from the Holy Spirit, and then standing in that. Amen? Just put on the full armor of God. After you've done all these things, to stand. Stand firm. Pray God gives each one of us a fresh picture of what he's doing in our lives, what he's intending. And then whether he gives us a full picture or only partial, we have something to stand in and say, God, I'm going to trust you for this. And I'm going to fight for this. 
And while you have me here in this world, I'm not going to give up because you're in control, Father. You're in control, and I'm going to fight this battle for lost people who need you, for my family, my friends, people I work with, go to school with, whoever it is. Help me to see this situation for what it really is from heaven's perspective. And then, God, in your time, I'll wait on you, but in your time, will you come through? Will you come through? So I don't know what it is that has you troubled, but would you stand with me, and let's close our time together with this song.